All right, so thank you so much for bearing with us as we figure out the technical issues. Um, as I was saying, we're just so thankful for you all to be here. And of course, um, especially thankful to our chief guest, Dr. Ghazi Shahadullah, incredibly timely and important session. So thank you, Dr. Shahadullah, for making the time to be here today for this first inaugural session. And also I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you, the participants for joining today's session. Before we start, let me share a brief summary of today's program flow and some basic ground rules. Um, so today's presentation is entitled, Online Learning Beyond Tests and Quizzes, Assessment Strategies that Facilitate Learning Remarks. And we have our American expert, Dr. Stephanie Moore here to share her expertise and experience on assessment strategies. We're so glad for her to, for her to be here to um, all the way from New Mexico uh, and to host her for our actually our second time um, for our virtual speaker program today. Um, based on the success and interest generated by last year's presentation on reimagining higher education systems, designs, tools, institutional strategies for a post COVID-19 world, we invited her back to share her expertise um, probably also because we're still not in that post-COVID-19 world um, on online assessment strategies, which clearly is a very timely topic, especially when we look at the education sector and, and how it's moving to a whole new era of digital teaching and learning. The educational experts globally are concerned about these assessments while teaching online. And this is an assessments are an integral part of the entire education system. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is going to be a three-part virtual series, um, and Dr. Moore is going to share information on how American universities are conducting an assessment for online teaching and learning. She will also be sharing her tips on developing online assessment tools, which I believe you'll find very effective and incredibly helpful. So we really look forward to your participation in all three sessions. Now let me welcome our chief guest, Professor Dr. Ghazi Shahidullah, the chairman of UGC University Grants Commission. Professor Dr. Ghazi Shahidullah is the chairman of UGC of Bangladesh, which is the statutory apex body in the field of higher education here in Bangladesh. Dr. Shahidullah also has served as vice chancellor of the National University for four years from 2009 to 2013. And he also participated in our State Department's flagship exchange program, the International Visitor Leadership Program in 2002. So Professor Dr. Kazi Shahidullah, over to you, hopefully. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for today's, uh, this online learning beyond tests and quizzes, assessment strategies that facilitate learning. This is a topic which shoots straight into our problem. So I would like to start off by, uh, uh, I think uh, is uh, the counselor for public affairs, Arlisa Reynolds from the US Embassy. I hope she has joined, I don't know. Uh, we have with me here, I think Sherlina Morgan, who is the host and the co-host Raihana Sultana, whom I know from before. We have the UGC members, Professor Alangir and Professor Bishudit. Uh, the honorable uh, speaker and facilitator, Dr. Stephanie Moore, and all, all participants for uh, today's talk. Actually, we are all passing through very challenging times and very uh, difficult times. Uh, the pandemic, nobody all over the world, nobody was aware of uh, the devastation that it was going to cause. We in, uh, in our country, naturally, we were even less prepared because we are not at all used to online uh, teaching and learning. We are more into the traditional mode of learning. So what has UGC done to keep education going during pandemic? Incidentally, UGC was the first institute in this country who did think about online education. So when the pandemic struck us, about 16 months earlier, I think March, uh, third week of March in last year, when the first lockdown started, we advised universities to try and uh, provide Stay online education to our students, because then the idea was that we have to keep our students engaged so that they don't lose track of education because they Many of them had left 
uh, the cities for their uh, rural areas. So we wanted them to be connected with education. So we advise the universities that kindly try and give some classes, take some classes on through online media. But at that point of time, honestly, our thinking was that maybe two months, two to three months and everything will come back to normal. So, so that was the point when we started this, but gradually we realized that the pandemic was going to last longer. And then we sat with the public universities and the private universities, uh, and, and we decided that everybody should start taking classes. But even at that stage, we were hopeful that uh, by the end of the year, we will have uh, you know, overcome the pandemic. And so we had decided at that point of time, our decision was that you take classes, but you can't take exams. Because we didn't, honestly, we were not sure how to conduct the exams, how to take practical exams, you know, how, how to do the assessments and all that. So we would be more comfortable with doing that in the classroom rather than through the virtual media. So our decision at that point was to go for class, for taking classes on a regular basis, keeping students engaged, covering as much of the course as possible, but exams will take later after the situation improves. But as things turned out, situation did not improve. It started to go from bad to worse. And then we realized that our students were also beginning to get frustrated, depressed, attending classes without examinations, without assessments, it was not making much impact. Uh, it, it was a kind of, you know, uh, there was no point in going through the motion. There was nothing effective, no, no effective teaching was coming out of our exercise. So at that point of time, we realized that we now have to go for exams and assessments as well. So we, we have to come up with new ways to tackle this uh, scenario. Now, in the meantime, what did we gather from the students about the issues and the problems from students and teachers about uh, online teaching? First problem we came to learn was the problem of not having any uh, devices, smartphone or, or access to uh, smartphone technology and, uh, and uh, uh, computers. So we tried to overcome that from UGC, we worked that out. And for the first time in the history of this country, we came up, we worked out a loan package for students interest-free loan package so that they could buy mobile phones, smartphones in order to stay connected to uh, their teachers' classes. So we gave, I think about $4 million uh, we spent on loans uh, to provide students with public university students to buy devices. Next, we, the problem that we faced was, okay, the, we, the device, they could uh, get the device, but that was not good enough because they needed money to buy the internet packages. And the internet packages were expensive. They had to be connected for longer periods of time. They needed more money. So the next step we took was, we got in touch with the service providers, Teletalk, GP, Roby, BangladeSync, and uh, I must appreciate that they responded to our request and they did come up with uh, special student packages for them to work with. And we also used our BGREN facilities to provide virtual classrooms uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for better, more effective classroom part participation. But still the problems persisted in uh, online uh, classes because one of the problems that surfaced was that electricity connection in the remote rural areas were not always stable and also poor network connection. That also was a major issue. Many students were complaining that they did not get uh, proper network connection. Sometimes they had to move out of their houses to connect. So that also was an issue. And finally, this is where today's uh, talk is important. Finally, we came to the, the problems that students came up with was initially, well, they showed some interest, but gradually classes tended to become boring. 
teachers were also not really ready for online uh, teaching. They did not have the expertise. And honestly and frankly, exams and assessments, that was a major issue. Our teachers need training, appropriate training, so that they can overcome these issues. So I think from that point of view, today's uh, talk is going to be extremely, extremely important because uh, the, the talk is going to focus on teacher training and on online teaching, on exams, on assessments, on how to overcome these problems. So within the overarching objective of learning for sustainable development, we now have to develop the capacity building of higher education of teachers uh, in Bangladesh on, uh, on using and creating uh, open education resources. Our teachers will have to learn to be adapt in devising appropriate learning solutions while maintaining a balance between the aspiration of stakeholders and available research, uh, resources. We will also have to focus on developing and promoting appropriate low-cost technology options on how best to efficiently use and utilize technology-enabled learning, blended learning, etc. These are going to play a critical role in the higher education uh, sector. So I think that these are the areas where we need to we need to give attention and focus because we are we will have to move from education from face to face instruction to online learning during the pandemic period and i may say so here that even after the pandemic is over we will still uh, need to live with online uh, teaching it is going to be an important if it's going to play a part in our regular uh, curriculum and in our regular academic programs because uh, online education is here to stay. So we have to learn how to use it effectively in order to promote education, uh, and meaningful education. We just don't want to go through the exercise of saying that we have taken so many classes and we have done this and that when uh, it hasn't really helped. We want to move into uh, quality education and effective uh, education. I would like to add a few words here about the overall education scenario. We are now observing many changes in the higher education sector in the 21st century. The purpose of a university has begun to change from the traditional elitist philosophy to an egalitarian one. The field of education has changed a lot in our country too and more changes will come in the near future. New technologies have started to emerge now, impacting the work environment. The education sector therefore needs to change and adapt as well. The challenge ahead for our university administrators is to transform our education curriculum, programs, and skills development infrastructure in order to deliver the talents needed for an innovative digitized economy. The ability of our country to grow and prosper depends critically on the ability of the universities to adjust with the changes in society and economic development. University administrators will have to be ever alert to the needs of the fast changing global economic scenario and must be ready to make necessary curriculum changes and adjustments to ensure that their graduates remain relevant to the demands of the market. I think I, 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 um, I would like to uh, draw everybody's attention here to the fact that as a catalyst of spreading quality higher education all over the country, UGC has been working hard to support the higher education institutions in using all affordable technologies to offer blended courses and updated learning. It is truly appreciable that the US Embassy Dhaka has come forward to support UGC in its current mission. Uh, I, I thank the US Embassy for 
for their uh, you know participation with us uh, in this time of need. I also thank the main speaker, facilitator Dr. Stephanie Moore, for joining this program and agreeing to share her knowledge and experience with us. We uh, need we need to understand how to go ahead with uh, uh, conducting examinations uh, fairly and to be able to assess the students properly. This session will no doubt be rewarding, stimulating and a great learning experience for all participants. I thank everybody who are attending this uh, session. All, I, am, um, I, I am sure everybody will have a fulfilling, satisfying session. I'm sorry I cannot stay through the entire session. I'll hang on for a few minutes more at an appropriate time. I'll quietly pass away. But uh, online education is here to stay. The earlier we embrace it and move forward and move on, that will be the right approach for us. We can't ignore online education. All participants should take this seriously, make use of whatever resources is available and ensure that our students get a meaningful education and that classroom, online classroom uh, education becomes enjoyable as well. Because if you cannot uh, attract students' attention, if the classes are not interesting, then students will drop out. I can, I, uh, uh, we were all students once and we all know that if classes are not interesting, nobody's attention will be focused. So with these few words, I would like to thank all for inviting me to give this opening remarks. And once again, my apologies for my lack of knowledge with technology. I couldn't get in earlier, uh, but I'm learning, I'm learning. It's never too late to learn. I'm only 70 years young now, but I'll catch up. Thank you very much, everybody. Good evening to all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Professor Kazi Shahadullah. That was incredible. And your remarks were such uh, an inspiration for everyone here. So thank you for your remarks and thank you for your partnership. Uh, now for our speaker, Dr. Stephanie Moore. She's an assistant professor in the Organization Information and Learning Sciences Program and is the Barbara Bush Foundation Fellow. Her areas of expertise include online and blended learning, educational and learning technology, multimedia learning, performance management, ethics of technology, and integration of societal impact into the design and planning process, as well as a deep background in accessibility and universal design for learning. Prior to joining her current program, she was the assistant professor of instructional design and technology in the Curry School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia, where she taught instructional design, performance improvement, online learning and ethics for learning and workplace technology. Dr. Moore, we are so, so glad that you can join us again to be our key speaker. Before I call on Dr. Moore for her presentation, I would like to hand it over to the, um, our esteemed moderator, our uh, education program specialist, Rehana Sultana, who we could not have done this program without, who has been working on this tirelessly. So I will turn it over to her and I am sure you all will enjoy such a fantastic program today. So Rehana, well, over to you. Thank you so much, Sherlina. I know um, I'm not going to actually stay between the audience and Dr. Moore uh, more than a minute because you know everyone is waiting for her to you know uh, listen to and learn from her experiences. But you know I I couldn't but like I have to give a huge thanks to UGC and Sir uh, Chairman Sir Dr. Professor Shahidullah because you know it was wonderful listening to him. It was wonderful learning about the steps that UG, UGC has taken and we are very grateful for this partnership. It, it's already a you know full house. I can see 500 participants already joined the session. So thank you everyone. Before we move to the actual presentation, I would just like to you know remind you about the ground rules. We have already said that we have we we have you know kept you on mute mode and we request to also you know keep your videos off so that you can kind 
kind of you know enjoy the uninterruptible like you know internet service and and you know and about the question answer session i'm sure like as you listen to dr moore you will have a lot of questions and we would request you to put your questions on the chat box you know our team is going to kind of you know uh, look over the uh, chat box and we're going to maintain the questions we will be sharing this with dr moore and dr moore herself is going to kind of you know look into your question and answer those as much as possible uh, as you can already see that we have already you know um uh, run over a little you know time so we would try to be mindful to the kind of time and uh, ask relevant questions and one last thing is that um we are also offering interpretation right we have the sign language interpretation and also the bangla language interpretation if you feel comfortable listening uh, to in bangla i would request you to go to your settings or menu bar uh, click on the language interpretation option and there is a you know icon uh, with a globe so you just click on there uh, you choose bangla and enable mute original voice and just click done and you should be good to listen to the bangla but if you can listen to us here uh, i would say like you know if you were good enough and if you are enjoying the english um uh, you know um interpretation as well uh, you just stay here <laughs> we do not want any more interruption right so uh without further ado i would uh, invite uh, dr moore uh, you know to give her uh, remarks um uh, dr moore over to you thank you so much well, thank you everybody for having me and um, again, <laughs> and for such gracious uh, introductions and for a very helpful overview of, as well of online learning, especially since the pandemic has started um, in Bangladesh. So um, good evening, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. And thank you again for having me. Um, <clears throat> a quick note I want to share, uh, we just moved into a new home, which is why my walls are bare behind me, <laughs> and we're still waiting for internet to be installed at our home, so I'm working on a uh, mobile Wi-Fi connection. Hopefully it will not, but I'm sharing my slides, I'm actually going to turn my video um, so that I don't hopefully run into any bandwidth issues. But let me get my screen going for everybody here. And let me stop my video. Um, so thank you for joining me today uh, to talk about online learning um, assessment strategies. I, I think one of the interesting things to note about effective assessment online learning is that the more that we explore assessment strategies, the more we are really talking about um, effective teaching. Let's move on from slide number one. Uh, all right, I'm gonna be speaking with you for three days. The good news is for days two and three, I'll have full internet. <laughs> so hopefully we won't run into some of these issues. But I wanted to give you an overview of some of what we'll be talking about, because I've read through your questions and your responses to the survey. Um, a lot of great questions. Um, these are questions I get a lot, and we will be talking through these across our three days. So even if I don't get to something today, um, I definitely want you to know we that is on the agenda across the three days that I'll be spending with you. So for today, we'll really be focusing on um, types of knowledge and how we assess those and what's a framework for your assessment. How do we assess online, um, different types of assessing online with some examples and ideas. And I'll touch a little bit on summative and formative assessment as well. Um, for days two and three, uh, and we are, we're still working on setting those specific dates, um, we'll talk about objective assessments where we're measuring knowledge and reasoning. So this is usually tests and quizzes. And then I'll also spend some time talking about cheating and how to prevent it that day. In day three, I'll talk about authentic assessments and spend a lot of time in particular talking about labs um, for like engineering and STEM disciplines. Um, I worked as the director of instructional design for several years for the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the University of Virginia, helping them develop online learning in engineering. Um, so I have a lot of great examples and resources to share around that. I saw some questions around that as well. 
uh, in the uh, questions that you had in response on the survey. So we will definitely get to uh, a lot of your questions and answers. But as you might imagine, uh, those are great questions and there's a lot to discuss there. Okay, so let's get going um, by examining some assumptions and beliefs about assessment. Uh, there are really kind of two main philosophies that tend to have to do with how you think about learning and how you view online learning. And this tends to significantly influences, influence one's views of assessment. So are learners going through it individually uh, and being tested on their mastery learning? And are we more focused on an individual who's progressing through content or are you aiming to design a class-based experience where the students are learning uh, with each other, from each other, from you, and with fellow students as part of a more social process for learning? So uh, individualized learning has a time and a place. This uh, more individualized approach, approach places more emphasis on an individual's needs and background knowledge it's primarily focused on cognitive learning, especially learning facts and, and things like that. And uh, individualized online learning uh, emphasizes mastery learning and individual progress through the content. <clears throat> Whereas social learning puts more emphasis on having interactions, learning as, as a community, learning together. And you may have objectives as part of your class that may include cognitive learning, uh, for example, uh, learning facts or learning how to reason or things like that. But you may also have other objectives as part of your class or for your students that include like effective objectives or maybe you want them to collaborate or engage in some sort of participation or demonstration or something like that. And it's the nature of these objectives um, that really inform our assessment decisions and our assessment options. So uh, I get asked to talk about online learning a lot. I know this screen is dizzying. <laughs> no, there's a lot of information going on here and you're thinking, what on earth do I focus on? Um, but I get asked a lot of questions about, is online learning more effective than face-to-face? -face? And the challenge we really have in answering that question is that there are so many variables involved in what makes for an effective online learning experience. And so these are all of the variables that have been examined uh, in the research. Uh, and this comes from Means, Baki and Murphy, a book on online learning that summarizes the research really well. Um, Often we talk about uh, other different variables like modality or maybe pacing or student to instructor ratios, whatnot. Today, of course, we're really going to be focusing primarily in these areas. What is the role of online assessments? Because online assessment can play very different roles. I'm gonna primarily be teach, talking about this from a perspective of um, what does this tell us? What, how, do, how do assessments provide us with information about the learning state? Uh, how do we uh, understand our students? That may then inform how we support students or if they're ready for new content and other areas, but my main emphasis will be on the learning state. And that's gonna intersect some with really talking about our pedagogy as well and the nature of the feedback that we provide learners. So these are some of the variables uh, that you know the chairman talked about, uh, how do we do online learning well? How do we make it effective and, and, and ensure that we're delivering quality? And these are, by talking about assessment, these are some of the variables or design options that we have um, for how we can make this a meaningful experience. So I wanna start all three of our days with a broad discussion on different frameworks for types of assessment and alignment, because I think this will help us organize our th your thoughts and your ideas and our conversation around assessment. So if you're not familiar with it, um, <clears throat> often in learning design, we use Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and this helps describe the cognitive domain of learning. 
And this is, I find this really helpful for defining learning. So first, if we talk about assessing learning, uh, what I'm doing is dialing us back to talk about, well, how do we define learning? What does that mean? Because there are different things that our learners learn. And depending on what we're focusing on, there are different ways to assess them. Um, so, and not infrequently, I will see a mismatch between an objective um, and the way in which that's being assessed. So, for example, I may hear a faculty member or colleague talk about, um, you know, well, I really want to see my students uh, be able to deal with a complex problem in our field and, um, and, and see how they handle new variables or novel information about that and contend with um, a sticky or complex problem. Well, that's very high order uh, learning on Bloom's taxonomy, um, but then it's being assessed with like a test or a quiz, which is much better aligned with um, testing. Do they remember something or do they understand something which is very foundational? So, um, we have different measures that we use when we measure learning, and uh, a lot of the tests that we design and develop have um, uh, items on them that either measure recall, retention, uh, transfer, or application. Uh, and I'll go into some of these in a little bit of detail, especially in day two, as to how these really relate to each other. But very briefly, recall is simply, do I remember that I've seen this? Um, retention is more, um, can I explain this back to you? Can I demonstrate to you that I understand? Transfer is taking that foundational knowledge and then doing something with it. So maybe I'm, I'm applying that to a new problem or I'm analyzing a case study or uh, you know, uh, creating something new with that knowledge. Um, and that kind of moves us on into application of that knowledge as well. So uh, remember and understand tend to fall under, uh, we, we measure those with recall and retention. But when we get into transfer and application, which is the higher order learning that we say we want our students to do and accomplish, now we're talking about very different objectives and these need to be assessed uh, very differently. So what are those different assessment options? <clears throat> Here I'm pulling from Stiggins and Conklin and Chapui Stiggins and Stiggins on um, understanding by design. So uh, this really gets us into different types of learning. Uh, often we talk about knowledge. This is the most common type of learning we talk about because uh, it's readily apparent. But then there's also reasoning, skills that we want our students to develop. And that may be, and some you may be teaching a combination of these where you want students to understand certain principles. Let's say in a class, you want them to think their way through some problem solving, but you also want them to demonstrate, for example, that they can execute a lab. Um, we also have products. We see this a lot in particular in, for example, um, art uh, classes, but you may also see this like in business or education where we want students not just thinking and reasoning, but also producing artifacts like a business plan or a lesson plan or something like that. Um, and then there's also dispositions, uh, which is more the affective uh, aspect of learning. Um, so it's not just learning um, facts or knowledge or reasoning or skills, but maybe you have objectives where you're really focused on, are my students um, developing like cultural responsiveness or something like that? So knowledge, of course, are facts and concepts that we want students to know. Um, for assessing that, we use selected response. And these are the most common tools that you see because they're the easiest to develop and the easiest to use. So that includes things like uh, tests and quiz features. Um, for reasoning, this is more about students using what they know. Now we want to take, we want them to take what they know and we want them to reason or solve problems. And we want to see that. So here we might be assessing them by using constructed response or extended response assessments. This might be open-ended assessment items, a paper, uh, you know, presentation, things like that. For skills, now we want them using their knowledge and reasoning uh, to perform a task skillfully. 
So we might ask them to do a performance assessment or a demonstration of that. And then we're assessing that demonstration. For products, uh, we want them using their knowledge, reasoning, and skills to create a concrete product. Um, so of course, we would have them create whatever that product is, and then we would assess that product. And then disposition, like I said, is more about students' attitudes and beliefs about a given domain or expectations or a topic. And we might assess that with different types of personal communications um, or journals or reflections or things like that. So I get asked a lot of questions about proctoring. Let me go ahead and address that real quick. Um, proctoring is really focused on assessments that measure knowledge and reasoning. Um, and so that might be things like auto graded assessments in the learning management system um, or adaptive learning systems um, that focus on learning at this level. And those certainly have a time and a place. But I want to highlight this for you because I, I want you to think about assessment as more as a universe of possibilities where um, testing knowledge and using, using proctoring is one component or one possibility depending on what the learning is that you want to assess. There's a whole other universe, uh, or, or let's say uh, there's several galaxies of <laughs> in the universe of uh, different assessment um, options as well. So when we, some of what we do around reasoning, maybe we assess through tests or quizzes, some of the reasoning uh, we assess through more authentic assessment. And certainly when we get into skills and products and dispositions, um, we tend to use authentic assessment where we're focusing more on application and it's more authentic to what's expected on the job or real life. <clears throat> and then I talked about Bloom's taxonomy earlier, and this is just Bloom's taxonomy overlaid. So again, depending on the objectives that you have for your class, you may have different um, assessment methods that come into play. Uh, so like I said, if you're really wanting students to be able to um, engage not just in remembering and understanding things, but application, analysis, evaluation, or even creating and producing things, then we're going to be talking about different assessment strategies besides tests and quizzes. Okay, so what specifically are those? All right, here we've got our five different domains of different types of learning. Um, for knowledge, what we're doing is assessing mastery of discrete elements. Maybe that's facts or spelling words or foreign language vocabulary or understanding parts of a plan. <clears throat> for reasoning, we're looking at blocks of knowledge rather than detached information. So for example, maybe you're wanting to assess, do they understand the causes of environmental uh, disasters or climate change? Um, the carbon cycle in the atmosphere, or how one mathematical equation can be derived from another, or the concept of checks and balances uh, in, in government. Um, or in this assessing here helps you identify whether a student has strong reasoning or problem solving. With skills, again, this determines whether a student can skillfully complete a task or perform in a desired manner. Maybe this is like mixing chemicals correctly or engaging in skilled debate, holding a conversation in a foreign language or making a decision in a legal case based on constitutional law. <clears throat> For products, uh, this focuses more on determining whether a student can create a quality product based on what they've learned. Uh, these might include like a business presentation or a lab report, a health and fitness plan if you're in like kinesiology. Um, a balanced checkbook register, a creative work of art, or even a news article or a broadcast. And then uh, dispositions, again, gathers information about students' dispositions. Um, and so you might um, interview them or have them journal or um, maybe have open questions during the instruction or do some oral exams for those. Okay, with those definitions in place, let's talk about actual assessment uh, methods and tools now. So some examples of how you would assess knowledge online 
are uh, quiz and test tools, which are very common. So most learning management systems have quiz or test tools. I saw a question in the survey questions about what do I do if I'm teaching language? Um, you might use something like audio voice threads. There are some really great tools for audio voice threads where you could, for example, post a question to students um, using audio instead of text and have them respond um, in the language that they are learning as part of a discussion. Um, or, you know, you might even be doing some recitations where a student has to record something that needs to be memorized. So they could record that uh, like on their mobile phone or on their device and then uh, share that through the course site in the learning management system. <clears throat> I understand um, not all of you have a learning management system or you're not sure if you have a learning management system. A quick note on that, I will say having a learning management system or an, a, a comprehensive interface for courses where students know where to go to get information and that interface looks the same from one course to another makes a big difference in their online learning experience and in helping to decrease their frustrations. So um, if you are not sure if your university has an online learning system, uh, learning management system, I would certainly encourage you to try to find out. There's a good chance I've seen many faculty at uh, universities around the world where they may not have a learning management system at their university, but they're using a free version of Google or Canvas or something like that. I've actually put together a free workshop that's in Canvas. Um, and I, I did that with a group uh, in Bosnia, Herzegovina. And um, a lot of them ended up really liking Canvas and decided to use the free version of that to help organize their classes. So if there's interest around that, I could maybe pull together a quick um, video to record and share to help with folks who either don't have an LMS or uh, don't know or don't have access to that. Uh, okay, sorry, so that was side trail. So moving on. So assessment of reasoning. Some examples of how you would assess reasoning online. And again, you could use quizzes or test tools, but use open-ended items. I've also done a lot of um, using quizzes and test tools to help students self assess um, how their learning experience is going. How are they as an online learner doing? Um, how are they, how well are they staying on top of things, things like that. So quizzes and test tools, while they can be used for standard assessment can also be used for helping students develop some self assessment strategies as well. Um, you could have students do sorting activities. Uh, we've done this where, you know, we'll send students something in PowerPoint or in Word, and they have to resort it or organize it or categorize things, save that document and submit that document back to us. Um, I see a lot of having students uh, record solving a problem and then submit that recording. Um, I see this especially a lot in say like math and engineering courses. Uh, one course that we put online, for example, in mechanical engineering, uh, the professor would uh, record a lecture using an iPad where he could annotate on things and, and explain a problem that they were working on. And then he would give his students a problem that they needed to work on. So the students would, on their own time, watch the video of him work their way through their problem and record themselves working through um, an engineering problem and then submit that recording as part of a required homework assignment. And then he would do a live session for his class uh, where they would once it, they would come back together and now he would give them a more complex problem to try to solve of that same type of problem and be able to work through it with them together. So having students recording problems that they solve and submitting those can help you. Um, I, what I hear from faculty who do this is it helps them not just evaluate reasoning, but it also helps you identify uh, misconceptions that your students have. They will tell you so many misconceptions <laughs> that they have as they record a problem and try to, try to demonstrate the, how their 
uh, solving that problem. Uh, you may have students write a paper on a topic and submit that paper electronically. Uh, perhaps a, you want them to give a presentation on a topic and see how well they can explain things to you. Um, and again, they might record and submit this as an assignment or even share that on a discussion forum. And there are typically there are tools in a learning management system that students and faculty can use to record videos. But then, of course, there are also apps or tools on uh, like mobile devices that students can use for that. Um, I've also done a lot around case studies and using case studies that require students to apply the course content and derive a solution. These have been everything, everything from very basic, uh, like a text description of a case study where the student has to reply to that in a discussion forum to um, a series of videos that students need to watch. And uh, I, I use this in one of my own online classes where students are given a video to watch of the Air France disaster. And we talk about what contributed to that and you know, how can we improve certain processes and practices around that. Um, in another course that I've designed with case studies, it was much more complicated. This was a advanced education class on assessment of learners with uh, blindness and visual impairments. Um, and we did a series of case studies where students were given original files and artifacts, and they had to read these and assemble these and make recommendations as if they were an educator out in the field. So there's a lot of different things that can be done around case studies as well, um, and, and, and all online. Um, for skills, some examples for online, again, having students record themselves performing a skill such as a lab or an exercise routine or a talk aloud on their design process for a product. And then you would assess that using a rubric. Um, again, back to my work with the School of Engineering. I, uh, we worked on designing a range of different labs that were online. A number of these were uh, basic electronic or mechanical engineering labs where the students were provided um, equipment, we called it lab in a box. Uh, it was a thing, uh, idea developed by Virginia Tech actually, and we used their labs in a box kits. So students would get these lab kits at home and then have to perform a series of different lab exercises. And we would either ask them to record themselves and submit that video for the class, or per the second bullet here, we would connect up during a live video session using, um, oh, Zoom wasn't around at the time, but things like Zoom uh, at the time, uh, for them to actually demonstrate their skill live during a video session. Um, and that would also allow some feedback opportunities and opportunities for the students to question things. Um, another great strategy for assessing skills online are simulations or role playing. Um, I've used a range of these. Uh, when I was in engineering, I taught a class on um, engineering ethics and we looked at um, uh, nuclear power plants and did a compare and contrast exercise with, uh, actually we partnered with the university in Germany. So we had students in the US and students in Germany. And we looked at decision-making around nuclear power plants in the US and in Germany and simulated that decision-making process with them and also had some role-playing as, as part of that. So I think I'm gonna be explaining that one a little in more detail in one of my later sessions uh, in day two or three. Uh, for products, um, for online, again, students could complete a project either individually or as a group and submit those. This is where you hear a lot about like Google Docs and students working together in something like Google Doc, um, which is a wiki. Uh, wiki is really a kind of general uh, type of technology where multiple people can edit. You may have heard of Wikipedia. And uh, that's, that's part of one of these ideas where multiple people can edit the same document. Well, Google Doc is simply a type of wiki <laughs> managed by Google Doc. Microsoft now makes it easy to share Microsoft 
doc, uh, Word documents and PowerPoints and things like that to collaborate on those as well. So it may be that you want students completing a product, um, let's say a business plan or a lesson plan uh, or a lab summary or something like that. Um, and maybe you want them to do it individually, which they can do and submit, or they could do it as a group uh, using a collaboration tool like Docu Google Docs or now Microsoft Word or something like that. <clears throat> you could also, um, I shared an example here of having students construct a writing example. Let's say you're a writing instructor um, and they could construct it individually or together, or you could even um, give them an essay that has issues in it and you want them to revise that and resubmit that. Um, you could use Google Docs to give them that essay and then have them make changes. And, and, and of course, one of the nice things about Google Docs is it tracks changes over time and you can see the history of the changes made, not just what changes were made, but who made those changes. Uh, and then finally, uh, dispositions. Uh, some examples of how you might assess dispositions online would be having students maintain a reflective journal throughout the class and providing them prompts that focus on beliefs and attitudes or um, having personal communications with students either through open questions or some one-on-one -on -one conversations with you and individual students. Um, in a class I teach right now on adult learning, I actually have students maintain a reflection journal. Um, in a class that I taught on online learning for teachers, uh, so for K-12 teachers, um, I provided them, we, we structured a journal where they had prompts every other week that I wanted them to think about that helped them both pull together their learning and metacognize their experience. Um, but also prompts that help them articulate some of their beliefs and attitudes and capture how those were shifting over time. <clears throat> so, okay, let me check in real quick. I see the chat is active. <laughs> let me see if I've got, if I see any questions about I'm seeing some questions around the LMSs. Moodle is a great alternative as well. Canvas and Moodle are both open source. I find them to be very flexible and friendly platforms. Google Classroom is a great alternative as well. Um, I uh, The one question I hear folks asking about Google, of course, is Google gathers data from that and you and or your students may not feel comfortable with Google gathering all of that information. So there's certainly some ethical considerations here as well. Uh, I... Okay, sorry, I've, uh, there's a lot to scroll through and I know I'm not getting through everything. I see a question about Canvas again, is Canvas free? Yes, it is. Um, well, you can do Canvas different ways. There's a free version of Canvas that you as an individual can use, or a university can choose to adopt Canvas and have a supported version of Canvas. Um, I actually use both. I use Canvas both through University of New Mexico, and I use an individual version of it um, for other instances where I, um, it doesn't make sense for me to use Canvas through UNM. So for example, when I did the workshop for um, the colleagues in Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, I used a free version of Canvas to put that together. Uh, so it's for you as an individual, it could be free. For universities, it's a low cost option. Um, but of course, you at the institution level, you definitely want to think about support. So okay. Uh, I see a question about the taxonomy um, for online that I'm showing. No, there's not a pop an article on this. I'm working feverishly to write it up myself and get that out because this is my own um, creative uh, product here where I have taken the existing taxonomy and translated this for online. So. Um, so you saw it here first, <laughs> but I'm working to get a paper out on that. 
good, I hope so. I hope to get that out soon for folks too. Okay, so let's talk about formative and summative assessment because this is where I think we get into really interesting uh, stuff. <clears throat> so typically when we assess learners, we kind of go throughout our courses throughout the semester delivering content. And then at the end of the course, um, we give them a test <laughs> and assess their learning. Um, that is what's called summative assessment. Summative assessment is when we give a test for students at the end of everything as a way to measure what have they learned. And we use information from summative assessment differently from how we use it for formative assessment. <clears throat> So the main question to ask, uh, oh, sorry, it may come back. We may give them a midterm in the middle as well, but even doing like a midterm and then a test at the end, this is really summative assessment. So a good question to ask to distinguish between formative and summative is do students receive some sort of feedback from the assessment or from the assessment process that allows them to adjust their work or their effort? That's really a key distinction between formative and summative. If the answer to, your, to that question is no, then we're talking about summative assessment. If the answer to that question is yes, then we're talking about formative assessment. <clears throat> so summative assessment is used to measure learning at the conclusion. It's evaluative in that we use that to evaluate a student and give them a final course grade. Um, and maybe we're giving them a final exam or midterm exams. But the, the purpose of it is not to give students feedback, but to give, but to determine a final course grade or maybe a, a grade for students at the midterm. Um, data from summative assessments is usually used to inform decisions on achievement. Um, you know, for example, how well did the student achieve X or Y effectiveness or courses or programs? So now we're talking more about like course or program evaluation. We may use that information on course placement decisions or graduation. Uh, for example, is a student going to be allowed to go into a particular course? Are they going to be allowed to graduate, whatnot? But we're not really using that data to turn it back around to the student to help inform the students ongoing learning process. <clears throat> if you're using only summative assessments, and especially if it's only once or twice in a course, this contributes to a high stakes envi learning environment that becomes very favorable to cheating. So I'm going to talk about cheating in day two and how we combat that. A lot of how we combat cheating has to do with our assessment practices and how we uh, integrate formative assessment into our courses, not just rely on summative assessment. So what we wanna do from a learning perspective, we're, here we're, I'm, again, I'm really putting the focus on wanting our students to engage and learn. What we wanna do then is lower the stakes and increase the support for meaningful learning and formative assessment is what helps with that. So let's talk about formative assessment. Let's say that periodically throughout your course, in addition to the summative, you also have some formative assessment opportunities where students are turning in, say, a proposal or an outline or a draft or something like that to you, um, where you're giving them feedback. As we incorporate these formative assessment opportunities throughout a course, it it lowers the stakes of that summative assessment, which lowers the stress level for students and helps them focus not so much on performing on a test, but on the learning process. Especially if what they're doing is we're using those as feedback opportunities. So uh, I actually modeled, this, this reflects one of my own course designs where students submit a proposal to me and then an annotated bibliography and then draft version number one, and then the final draft. Um, and so I give them feedback on the proposal, and then I give them feedback on their annotated bibliography, 
And then uh, I do a peer assessment here for feedback on draft version number one. And then for the final draft, I actually incorporate in a very quick um, peer and instructor feedback loop here as well. Um, so I use peer evaluation to help offload some of my own work <laughs> and get them sharing their work and discussing with each other. Um, and so you can see the purpose of these formative assessments is to generate these feedback loops or feedback cycles in the class. So I'm not merely evaluating a student's paper, for example, in one shot at the end as a form of summative assessment, but I've broken it down into a series of deliverables where I want them to turn things in and I'm gonna give them feedback on stuff and I wanna see how they're thinking and how they're doing and how they're progressing as they go. This way scaffolds them a lot more, provides them a lot more support. Um, and like I said, it also lowers the state. It also gives me a chance to get to know the students. So when I get a final paper at the end, I know their voices, I know who's been writing, I know how it's been developed. So I know if they're turning in an authentic paper to me or if they have plagiarized. So formative assessment really puts more of the emphasis on assessment for learning, not, not just assessment of learning, but now we're talking about assessment for learning and how that assessment informs the student's learning process. The purpose of formative, or one of the purposes of formative assessment is to provide strategy focused feedback on what to improve. So not merely error, error focused feedback. In other words, I'm not really going through these and doing like grammatical checks or APA formatting or things like that. Sometimes I do that, but really my primary focus is on their strategy and their knowledge and reasoning and providing them specific feedback on how can they improve their reasoning abilities and the strategies that they're employing for the way in which they're going about their work. Now, we can also use it as a um, diagnostic as well. Um, or for progress monitoring. So sometimes I see uh, like in, let's say reading or language or things like that, um, you formative might look more like, um, I'm gonna test you on something right now, see how you're doing, give you that feedback and identify the areas for improvement. We're gonna go along with more instruction. I'm gonna give you the test again. Let's see how you're doing now. What are the new areas you need to focus on? And then kind of keep using it that way as well. So you could use formative assessment as an ongoing diagnostic and progress monitoring strategy. And again, you could blend these things. So you could have, um, this should be a smaller circle. So you could have a blend of uh, summative assessment where you're still doing your midterm and your final exam, but then also incorporating some opportunities for formative assessment throughout the class. Um, so I'm seeing some questions about uh, like class size and how that relates. Um, is uh, formative assessment graded towards the final grade of the course? Um, let me let me kind of break these down into let's talk about class size on one and then st uh, strategies on the other. So for class sizes, um, yes, I actually can uh, uh, have seen this used in class sizes that go up to um, about 150 uh, to 200 students. I mean, Obviously, you're trying to find the time, right, as an instructor to figure out when am I going to be giving all of this feedback. Um, TAs can be helpful for that if you have teaching assistants. Um, I also, like I mentioned earlier, I will incorporate not just instructor feedback cycles, but peer feedback cycles. So maybe during one of these, what I'm having students do is share a draft in a discussion space and where they're getting their feedback is from their peers, not just from me, which forces all of the students, and I have them use the rubric. So if I use a rubric for grading, I have them use that same rubric in those discussions to give the peer feedback to each other. So it's forcing everybody to get familiar with the, with the rubric um, and then also giving feedback. And then what I'll do is I'll go into the discussions and um, where I see I need to give feedback um, that's either not happening or I really wanna give something more detailed or I wanna summarize feedback for everybody, 
then I will focus my time and energy that way. So you can use, especially in larger classes, you can use peer or student feedback loops as well um, to help offset some of that workload and help you focus in on the areas where you really need to focus your time. <clears throat> um, okay. What were some of the other, uh, a good ratio? It's hard, to, it's hard, for me, it's really hard to say what a good ratio is. Um, these actually reflect two different course designs here. You can see these are different balances between summative and uh, formative. So my courses personally tend to look a lot more like this first one, um, but I have had some courses, especially at the undergraduate level that look more like this second one where I do some midterm and end of course tests, but then we're also doing some projects as they go and some activities that I'm grading them on. I saw another question about, am I calculating formative assessment into their final grades? I do incorporate that. So especially if what we're doing is we're breaking down a project over time, and this is what I tend to do more with my upper level undergraduate and my graduates to, uh, classes, um, each uh, component is worth a grade um, for those students. So instead of getting one grade at the end, they are building their grade and getting feedback from me as they go uh, using a formative assessment process. I will also note, I allow my students, if they get a B minus or lower, they are more than welcome to revise and resubmit based on my feedback. I know you're probably thinking that sounds like a lot of additional work, but um, the truth of the matter is that a lot of students don't take you up on that opportunity. <laughs> so I may have 50 students in a class and allow them to revise and resubmit, and I'll have two or three that take me up on that. Um, so, uh, and it's a nice way for me to encourage them to treat my feedback, not just simply as an endpoint, but if I want them to take my feedback and actually act on that feedback, then I need to give them an opportunity to do that. So you, you do need to figure out if, if you want to do formative assessment, um, students need an opportunity to act on that feedback that you're giving them. Um, I know that there's some other faculty members who do not use um, who do not give grades for their formative assessments and don't calculate anything quantitatively based on that. Um, uh, but then they calculate a final grade or they even do, um, there's a lot of discussion right now around what's called ungrading. Um, I'm, I'm very ambivalent about this idea. So it, that's my, my honest impression is we don't have any really good research to show whether ungrading practices result in learning or not. So I'm um, reticent to actually recommend it, but there are some folks who uh, don't actually grade or they do what's called contract grading where the student uh, contracts with them for what grade they wanna pursue in the class. And that's that's a whole other ball of wax, but. Um, so no, peer assessment is not always credible um, for assessing students. In fact, I find that when I use peer assessment, it helps me kick up students' misconceptions. So that's why I do, when I use peer assessment, I still monitor those discussions in the discussion boards in my online class. And I will go in and provide either corrective feedback or elaborate on that and say, okay, this, this is helpful, but let's also think about this aspect of it, or I would like you to dig deeper and think about these things here. Um, how can each of you address that in your papers or something like that? Okay, let me keep moving on in the interest of time. So um, feedback um, is one of the most powerful strategies that we have. And again, when you use formative assessment, now you're pulling in the strategy of feedback. Feedback becomes not an end of, end of course comment for students, but it's an actual instructional strategy. Um, these are uh, court comments from students um, about feedback that they received in their online classes. Uh, so you can see, um, we see repeatedly that students highly value feedback from professors when they get it. They want to have the opportunity to act on that feedback from faculty members. 
And we also know from research that um, strategy focused feedback in particular has a very positive effect both on motivation and on learning and application. So as you think about your assessment strategies, I hope after today, you're starting to think about where might I incorporate even just a little bit of formative assessment into my teaching. So if I go back um, to this, uh, let me include a personal note about this. My own teaching has really changed over the last uh, 20 years. I guess I can admit that, where I used to do a lot more of you know, midterm and end of course evaluations. Um, what I do now, this is not what I just started doing 20 years ago. My teaching has sort of evolved to this point as I've gotten more and more comfortable with formative assessment and how to give that feedback and how to make the time for that as well. Um, so you may find that what you want to do, if these are very new ideas, is retain a course design where you've got your midterm and final or final, but maybe identify just one or two opportunities throughout your course where you're going to create an opportunity to provide your students a little bit of formative feedback. I did that initially, um, let's say right more around this point in the course where um, I was teaching writing and uh, they would have a final paper due. So about two to three weeks or so before their papers were due, I started having them turn in drafts that I would review and that we would also um, go through in class together. I do think students find it useful to see what others are doing. And you can also call out exemplary practices, by the way, to other students and say, um, you know, look at how this student is using references and how they're quoting um, or how they've reasoned their way through this. This is an excellent example. You know, make sure you're doing that in your paper. So I pulled in just one formative assessment feedback loop when I first started trying this um, and gave that time. And I, I saw such a dramatic increase in the improvement of student learning and their work in the final paper, as well as student satisfaction with the course itself and with the process. And so over time, I've just kind of broken it back down into these pieces. So I didn't go straight from one test or two tests to this. I definitely took my time as an instructor to incorporate one and then two and then maybe more formative assessment feedback loops as I was developing my own comfort and skill in this area. <clears throat> okay, so feedback has a positive impact on transfer of learning, which is that means we're helping them make their knowledge active instead of inert. In online learning, it increases a sense of social presence and it can help decrease that sense of distance. They feel like you, the instructor and their peers are there um, supporting them and giving them feedback, um, which of course leads to increased student satisfaction. And this also helps address issues with motivation because you're helping to address confidence issues in particular with students. So, very quick summary, um, we wanna provide strategy-focused feedback, not error-focused feedback. There's good research that shows that error-focused feedback when we're telling students what they did wrong and that's it, or what to fix. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it that way. When it's all about these are the errors, it's actually demotivating for students. If we try to turn it into, okay, here are the things that you're doing well, here are the areas that I want you to work on, and here's how I want you to work on those areas. So that's giving them a strategy for how to address your feedback has a positive impact on motivation, satisfaction, and learning. Um, this I know is a changing role for instructors. I've been through that change myself, which is why I wanted to go back and share my own story about my own change in, in my practices. Um, so if you feel like you need to break this down and do this in small bites and make minor, you know, one small change per semester or per year, that totally makes sense. Uh, that's how I did it myself. Um, some tools that will help support that are um, tools that help you comment on submissions. So maybe that's uh, 
software like that allows you to annotate on PDFs. Um, I use PDF annotator because it has a lot of great annotation tools and it works on either Mac or PC. Um, Adobe Acrobat also works fine for that. Maybe I give them feedback via discussion forums in our online class in the learning management system. Um, and that could be the written or audio or video feedback. Um, and then of course, I also use synchronous tools like Zoom for live class meetings and office hours. So in a few of my classes, I will actually either have whole group meetings with the whole class where we come and students can ask about things and share um, uh, where they are on a paper or project that they're working on. Um, and then I can answer questions for them. Or if I'm teaching a design class, I use a, um, I have small group meetings where students come, share their designs, and we basically treat it like an online studio, um, giving feedback uh, during that time as well. So I know we're running long in part because of all of the technical glitches. Um, so I'm gonna end with this slide here and just emphasize um, the learning benefits of direct application that when we design our courses um, and our assessments in particular to assess a direct application, this is where we really start to see students moving past simply regurgitating information to applying it and seeing the meaningfulness of it and the usefulness, the relevance of that work to their lives and to their jobs, whether that's a current job or a future job. So again, these are quotes from students um, in online classes talking about um, uh, you know, completing activities and applying them in my own classroom. This is from an education student. Um, they're very meaningful me, to me because as a classroom teacher, I don't have a lot of time outside of my job. So this was a student who was in a class where they were working on projects in class that they could immediately turn right around and use um, in their classes where they were teaching as well. Um, and so they see the relevance and the usefulness of that assessment um, strategy uh, where they're having to produce something. So this here, we're talking about products. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, the information has improved my teaching. So again, helping learners see the direct application of what they're learning to the job. Um, professor tries to get us engaged and make assignments that require us to talk with people, interview and observe. So it's interesting and it teaches me a lot. Again, tying our assessment strategies back to how we design assignments and what it is that we're actually asking students to do. We can ask them to engage in authentic activities um, and then assess those activities, whether they submit a written artifact or a re video recording or something like that to us. And I'll end with this note about everything I learn is relevant and useful to my current position. We hear this time and time again, and we see this come up in the research as well, that the more we pivot our assessment practices to emphasize not just testing knowledge or reasoning, but really emphasize more application, analysis, evaluation, producing, the more that learners see it as engaging and relevance as well. So, okay, I'm gonna end on that. I'm sorry, I know we have gone past time uh, a little bit. I'm gonna stay on to help answer questions. I recognize it is late for you, um, so if you are, in desperate need of getting to bed, <laughs> please feel free to. Otherwise, I am gonna stay on here to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. It was a remarkable presentation. It was really lovely listening, uh, you know, from you and also, you know, going through all this, um, you know, aspects of assessment that you already shared. And as uh, we said in the beginning that this is just the beginning, this is going to be a three part, uh, you know, session. So there will be two more sessions and we look forward to everyone's participation during those sessions so that, you know, Dr. Moore has more time to answer all the queries. And I have seen that, you know, Dr. Moore, you have tried to kind of, you know, answer um, uh, many of the questions that we had during this, uh, you know, uh, discussion, and people were uh, like, you know, enthusiastically participating. And I also saw that some, uh, you know, esteemed professors were also kind of, you know, 
thinking that it was a, diff a little bit difficult to kind of, you know, follow the uh, discussion due to the chats, but, you know, that's how we show interaction, right? So this is also something like, you know, um, uh, during online class, like how do you monitor your students, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, Dr. Moore, I think, you know, we will have more questions, but that's something that we also wanted to uh, hear from you just very briefly. Uh, yes, there we will have to do assessments, we will have to assess our students, right? And, you know, give them grades, but at the same time, during a class, like say, for example, we have 500 participants, but in a, in a, in a actual scenario in Bangladesh, you might have like, you know, 100 students, right? And some will be chatting and some will be kind of, you know, texting or like sending photos. So maybe if you can throw a little light on like how to monitor a class with a like, you know, large uh, classroom size. Thank sure. You. So, <clears throat> yeah, I actually had everything set up uh, the way I like it uh, before my Zoom drop. Uh, so typically I've got like my presentation window um, and, and I, I will say I use a dual monitor setup. So I have two monitors for my computer and now I've had that for about 20 years and I feel like having, if you can, having dual monitors is essential for online learning. So I've got what I'm presenting on one screen and then I've got the chat window right next to that on the other screen so that I can kind of check in and look at that as I go. Um, learning to monitor the chat with students is definitely an art form that you learn over time and develop more comfort and skill in doing that. Um, so I've uh, gotten more comfortable in being able to check over real quick and see as things go. Um, like I typically will um, scan very quickly and look for an actual question mark. <laughs> And that's what I use to um, hone in on questions or something like that, especially when they're, see right now there's a question mark, so it pings in my brain. Um, and so I'll use that very quickly to scan for things. I will say there's this um, idea of uh, uh, um, in online learning where there's um, students have a lot of chatter in the background. And um, I'm sorry, now I'm blanking on the term for it from the research. Um, but it, it's going to come to me in like five minutes. Uh, but uh, it's very common for learners, both online and in a classroom environment, to talk with each other and, um, and have a lot of chatter. What we've learned from studying that is that actually 75% of that um, chatter is somehow related to or supporting the learning. So I tend to not worry about it. And if there's a social element of that, um, it's fine because students need to build those social relationships with each other as well um, in order to feel comfortable and feel like they are part of a learning environment. So um, uh, by way of example, in engineering, you know, there've been studies that show that um, women in engineering feel like it's a chilly environment or like they're left out of that. Well, that's because they're getting left out of social interactions as well as important learning interactions. So um, those social interactions may feel off topic and they may be frustrating for us, but for learners, they're a really important way for them to connect, especially in online learning. And as long as I would say most of it is really about learning or they're sharing ideas or things like that, that's fine. That's the type of background chatter that is going to happen naturally in a classroom that you want to happen. So, for example, in a classroom, a student may turn to another student and say, I didn't understand what she just said. Did you understand that? And the other student may say, oh, yeah, think about it like this, you know, and explain it in a different way than maybe I would have. Those are great student to student interactions that support the learning um, process. So I tend to allow chat um, going on, you know, like we have here. In fact, here, you know, folks are sharing ideas, maybe making connections, asking great questions. Um, and then what I do is I go in and I monitor that. Another strategy that you could use is actually asking two or three students to be your chat uh, or conversation monitors for that session or that week. So just like how I have Rayana here helping me monitor the chat and um, identify the questions and things like that, you can also ask students and again say, today I want you know this person and that person to help me monitor in the next session, 
two other students help you monitor that. So, uh, you know, get the students involved in helping you with some of these management challenges and they'll feel more involved in the class too. And students are also gonna be more responsive with other students. Um, and they may even pay more attention if they feel like next time it might be them who's helping to monitor things. <laughs> so. Yes, very much on point. Thank you so much. And I see that, you know, people are saying that we love that you were supporting chatting in the classroom. You know, and <laughs> actually, that brings me to the, you know, second part that I wanted to ask you, because like, you know, when uh, you talked about involving, you know, students in, you know, peer assessment, right? And I really like that idea, because especially in Bangladesh, where we have really large classrooms, so, you know, from like, you know, 50 to 120 students, right? And, you know, in in-person classes as well, we suggest our teachers to kind of, you know, divide the students in peers right and in groups and a kind of you know let them do some activities so I think you know uh, at this situation where we are teaching online and still we have to kind of you know address that large classroom we need to involve the students as much as possible and like you said that at least also kind of you know making the monitors that that's a like you know really good idea in that way they will feel ownership and also you know they will uh, kind of you know support each other uh, but at the same time I think you know we had a question about the credibility of you know uh, this peers assessment right so any 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 just a very brief brief note on that like you know how to address that how to make that credible you know for our uh, you know, teachers yeah so i typically before i even put students like let's say i'm going to use a group strategy or do breakout rooms or something like that i typically will take the first few weeks of my class to really get to know my students and see who's on point um, and who seems to really be grasping things and who does not seem to be grasping things. And then um, usually at around the end of week two or so, I'll sit down and either formally or informally start creating groups. Um, sometimes we have a group project and I want to intentionally put students into a group. Other times I know we're going to do peer assessment and it's too much for the students as well to do, you know, 20, 50 other students. And so I'll put them into smaller discussion groups for that. Um, and I will uh, always try to anchor those groups with students who I feel are doing really strong, uh, strongly or, you know, trying to balance out some of that. I wish I could say that that's a 100% foolproof strategy. I always seem to end up with a group that struggles. Um, so that's why I go in and, and I monitor them as well. So um, let's say I'm doing Zoom um, for synchronous sessions. And, you know, with Zoom, you can do breakout rooms and put them into small groups. First of all, I do like to use that for them. And I like to give them about 10, 15 minutes of time, maybe 20, you know, depending on the, the class length. Um, to just have their time to discuss and share without me there. But then I do go from room to room to check in on them and see how the discussions are going and ask questions. In discussions, um, in discussion forums, you can create discussion forums for smaller groups. So it's not just the whole class, um, which once you get above 20, it's a lot, even 15 to 20 is a lot to monitor, but that's manageable. But once you start even getting above 20, it's a lot to manage. So I start breaking them down into smaller groups. I'm intentional about how I'm grouping them. Um, and then I am going in group to group to monitor those conversations myself. But rather than feeling like I have to respond to everything from a student, I look at how the whole conversation is going, and then I provide one or two, maybe three targeted um, responses to an individual or to the group, um, rather than trying to respond to everybody. So that's a way that you can you know, rely on students, because honestly, by and large, most of the time, you're going to get good feedback from students. And you may even get students who are kind of like, oh, wow, your weaker students are going to see the performance from your stronger students. And that's going to really drive them and motivate them as well as give them evidence, you know, something that they can see as an example to strive towards. So I think all in all, it's, it's really good to share that and can be a strong driver and motivator for students. But yeah, you are gonna have problems with students who aren't giving great advice, 
where they really don't understand. And I tend to be very direct in those instances of um, actually that's, you know, there's a misunderstanding here. So let's clear up that misunderstanding um, and address that directly. Cause I find typically it's not just one student having that misunderstanding. It's a lot of them um, when things like that crop up. So, so those are kind of different strategies, you know, purposeful grouping, breaking them into small groups, monitoring things, trying to balance. Um, if you are doing peer assessment, trying to balance those groups between weak students and strong students, things like that. Um, I see a question about the second and third sessions. Those are gonna be on other days. <laughs> so otherwise I think I would lose my voice. <laughs> Right. Yeah, sorry, I, I wrote like 2022. No, it's 2021. I'm kind of, you know, overwhelmed with all the responses. It's so great that people are interested and, uh, you know, uh, thanks to everyone. So I know we are over time. So, um, uh, and, and as we said that, you know, we we're going to host two more sessions. And I actually had a few more questions about plagiarism and also kind of, you know, how to control cheating during online classes and which platform is better, Google or Canvas. Like, you know, there are so many questions still coming in and uh, I hope to share all, everything with you and also I saw that people are requesting to you know um, get the slides I believe we can do that you know maybe uh, after all the sessions are done we can uh, kind of you know compile a list of resources that we usually do we will uh, you know share the resource list we will share these slides with all the participants and this session will be recorded so before uh, we proceed to the closing uh, Dr. Moore any closing thoughts any thoughts for like you know our participant and also maybe a cliffhanger so that you know they all come back and kind of you know participate in our next sessions please so you know um, no, um, i mean very broadly i know folks are teaching across very different disciplines and domains i hope i shared enough examples today across some of those and we will certainly have more examples coming up um, as well um, i wanted to circle back to one question i saw just kind of zing by about um, students who are performing A, is it unfair to them if we let students who B, B minus or whatever continue to improve? I think this really, again, this all goes back to how are you thinking about assessment and what is your view of it and what is your philosophy of that? If your goal is more criterion referenced, in other words, my goal isn't to compare students to each other, but to get all students to a certain level of knowledge and skill. You know, I want the students who, who leave my class to be able to do certain things. There are some students who are gonna need more support and more scaffolding and more feedback, more opportunity for iteration and improvement in order to get there. Um, I still tend to find, even with allowing that, that my A students or A plus students always distinguish themselves. And those who are struggling are not really likely to be getting A's and A pluses, but I may be able to bring them up to a B, B plus or an A minus range, and at least an area where I feel like, okay, if they're gonna go out and get a job in this area, I feel comfortable or confident knowing that they're gonna be able to do what they're gonna be expected to do. So it's definitely a, a, a different way of thinking about it um, than maybe the ways in which we have thought about assessment. So I th thank you all for such lovely comments and questions, so many great thoughtful questions. I really look forward to the next couple of sessions with you. And we'll be thinking about how, can, how I can address some of your questions that you've raised today in the next couple of sessions going forward as well. So. Thank you again for having me and for staying up late to participate in this. Thank you so much, Dr. Meyer. It was really wonderful. You know, I'm not a subject matter expert. I just kind of, you know, uh, try hard and like, you know, we work in the embassy to kind of, you know, improve the education scenario in Bangladesh, you know, in collaboration with our speakers, our specialists, right? So we really appreciate your time and thank you so much for staying over time. And I apologize for all the like, you know, technical issues. You know, that's the challenge of like online <laughs> teaching and learning, right? We are all teachers here and this is not a kind of, you know, a very like uncommon 
things. It's a common phenomenon of online teaching and learning nowadays, right? So I, I really thank all our participants, specials, um, you know, for bearing with us at the beginning because we had a little bit of technical issues. But I think, you know, at the end, we can all say that, you know, it was a wonderful session and looking at the <laughs> comments, the like, you know, the, the suggestions and all the questions, I, I really feel that we need to do more. And uh, yes, we had questions that when we're going to do it, uh, you know, we are going to do the next two sessions within August and uh, October 2021, not 22, it's 2021. And we will be reaching out to all our participants. I was really missed to see um, the participants here. We had like university VCs, deans, administrators, university professors, you know, material developers, all, all sorts of like, you know, academics here who are really interested to kind of, you know, make a difference. And especially during this COVID, I think, you know, our teachers, our academics are the one who, uh, who deserves a huge shout out from us because you know they are the one who have who are showing like perseverance creativity and we, we we could have never known that you know our teachers are so creative and so kind of you know um, engaging and 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 like you know committed until unless we had the situation so you know we always find opportunity in our challenge and i think this was one of those sessions that we had so thank you so much once again for your time i would uh, again take a moment to um, you know thank um UGC University Grants Commission. Yeah, I, I would be really, uh, really obliged to thank like, you know, Dr. Alumgir. Um, Dr. Alumgir have been instrumental in, in, in arranging all this like, you know, event and also promoting the um, event on UGC's website and inviting the teachers. I would like to um, thank our technical support team, our EMK team, my colleague, Shaun, Farah, uh, Sarah, of course, like, how can I forget Sarah, right? So, uh, and also our interpreters, Asma, Appa, Tofik, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for your wholehearted support. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in our next sessions. And thank you so much once again, Dr. Moore. Thank you. Take care and stay safe. Good night. You too. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.